Today we're going to be looking at another video by Kurtzkasa. We're going to be looking at why Korea is dying out. Looks like they're talking mainly about South Korea. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. Every two years, one million Japanese disappear. China's population what? will halve by the end of the century. The median age... Oh, we're looking at population trends. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure what was happening. Italy has reached 48. All around the world, birth rates are crashing. Is humanity dying out? What's going on? And how bad is it? Hmm. Or are we just reaching our capacity? For hundreds of thousands of years, the human population barely grew at all, haunted by disease, famine, and war, until the Industrial Revolution. Exponential progress led to exponential growth, pushing our numbers to 6 billion in the year 1999 and 8 billion just 24 years later. And our numbers will continue to rise for at least another 60 years, but this growth obscures Looks like they're something. just leveling off. People kind of stopped having babies. For a stable population, every couple needs to have two children on average. If the number Place is higher, it grows. If lower, it shrinks. If it's well below, it shrinks a lot and quickly. Like in South Korea, one of the hottest exporters of pop culture. Its fertility <laughs> rate led 0.8 children per woman in Ooh. 2022, the lowest in the world. This means 100 South Koreans of childbearing age today will have 40 kids, who then will have 16 kids, who then will have six. Now, big assumption, they're assuming this thing is constant. Because I remember when I was a kid, and this may have been what the data was showing when I was a kid, that everyone was like, oh my goodness, population's going out of control. We're going to hit 20 billion people by 2100 or something like that. And now those, those uh, estimates have since shifted. So are we now saying we're going to have the opposite thing of population rate going down too fast or leveling off in a way that's not sustainable it's it's interesting to see this sort of thing if nothing changes then within 100 years there will be 94 percent fewer young people and south korea will see a population implosion that is if that is a big if because <laughs> these things have changed they've changed a lot in 20 years so 100 years we don't extrapolating that is pretty challenging. I'm going I'm I'm questioning that. <laughs> Stay the same. We have yet to see if there's a bottom to fertility rates. Although looking at the bigger picture and absolute numbers, this population will not shrink that much. It simply returns to the level it once was. In 1950, there were 20 sure. million South Koreans. In 2023, there are 52 million, and by 2100, there will be 24 million again. But the issue is not that there will be fewer South Koreans. The issue is the composition of the population. In 1950, yeah. the median age was 18. In 2023, it's 45. In 2100, it will be 59. Mm, a country okay. of seniors. And South Korea is far from alone. China may be... Would 59 still be senior in 2100? Are people going to be living longer? That 59 is now just barely middle-aged the steepest population reversal in history, unstoppable at this point. Rapid industrialization, urbanization, and rising incomes meant that the Chinese started to prefer smaller families. That, the plus the introduction policy. of the one-child policy, which aimed to slow population growth, means that China has had a low fertility rate for decades. With a fertility rate of 1.16 births per woman, within four generations, 100 young Chinese will turn into 20. China's fertility rates are now one of the lowest in East Asia, lower than even Japan's. In comparison, Europe's depopulation is much slower, despite low fertility, since unlike Asia, most states have had a steady flow of immigrants. The impact is complex as a good... That's kind of, yeah, well, it's, I mean, that's one thing, but it's kind of the whole immigration, we're just shifting, right? We're not looking at the total, I guess, world population, but... Then again, this video talked about Korea, so I think we're just looking at things on more of a regional level. Chunk of immigrants come from other low fertility rate areas. The number of immigrant women who do have a lot of children is not yet high enough to make a big dent, and fertility rates of immigrants tend to adjust to the native population within two to three generations. 
In Eastern That's Europe, true. the decline has sped up even more because many young people have emigrated to stronger economies like Germany, whose median age is one of the highest in the world at 46. Hmm. Latin America fell below replacement in 2015. In the US, immigration is the only thing keeping the population growing substantially. There are still places where fertility rates have not fallen below replacement yet. In much of the Middle East, North and Sub-Saharan Africa, say, fertility is still high, which creates the same concerns about overpopulation as when Asia grew very quickly in the 1950s, but that turned out to be unfounded. But recently, the UN has what reduced its forecast for Africa's population drastically. For Nigeria, estimates were lowered from 733 million to 546 million by 2100. Mm. Similar trends are being noted across the continent. As Africa develops, fertility rates are shrinking much faster than anticipated. It's becoming more likely that East Asia's story will repeat itself. By the end of the century, most places in Africa may be below replacement too. So declining birth rates and aging populations have become a general trend all over the world. Why is all of this a big deal? <laughs> Demographics and poverty. <laughs> For a functioning society, you need enough people in the prime of their lives. Young and middle-aged people do most of the work. In any economic system, going. working age people create a society's wealth. In retirement, you stop contributing as much to the economy. But the majority of healthcare costs are generated by seniors. The way the world worked in the past was that a lot of younger people took care of a few older people. Imagine a society where most people are older than 60. The financial burden for the young will be immense, unsustainable. Ooh, it's going to be like a really pointy downward pyramid scheme, if you will. The, the few going, throwing the money upward. Uh, okay, that's a problem. Even for the richest countries. Even in the best case, this will mean people having to work way longer, exploding healthcare costs and poverty, while states with shrinking income struggle to keep up with rising costs. That is one thing. I, mean, I was just now. I've uh, I've read a few things about yeah. People are like Generation Z might have to work until they're eighty, but then again they'll live well over a hundred. I was thinking, but that was more of what that was looking at. But if you're going to have this sort of just with everything getting more expensive, that could be that could be another reason. Technology might soften the blow, but can't compensate entirely. We can see this happening yeah, already. With the automation 11 out of 31 workers. provinces in China are running deficits for their pension funds. They got old before they got rich, and now they can't really catch up anymore. Just like Social China's Security working in the age US. population is predicted to fall by 20% or 200 million people by 2050, as much as today's entire working age population of the US. Infrastructure collapse is an almost universal constant of population decline because infrastructure works at scale and doesn't get cheaper to operate if it's... You see, that was just any abandoned town that the infrastructure goes and people just leave in towns that just aren't used anymore. I guess the most extreme example would be something like in that you'd have other towns that, I mean, I'm not just talking about things like Pripyat where there was, an, there was a nuclear disaster there, but you'll have areas that start to look like that just for, for economic reasons, just not being able to support the infrastructure by fewer people. If a population declines, be it because of urbanization or the loss of industry and employment, once people and their income disappear, the resources necessary to sustain first, yes. infrastructure disappear too. You can see it in many depopulated towns and cities in East Germany that suffered mm. sharp population decline after German reunification. Or look at Japan. You can tour the countryside to see dying towns. Wait, if there are few people, won't life get cheaper and better? And there'll be more resources to go nope. around. Well, no. Basically, the opposite of an economy of scale. Just because you're not going to have you're not going to have that infrastructure being maintained. That's going to that's going to um, create those cost reductions. Population decline doesn't lead to prosperity. It's people's ideas and work that create our prosperity, not the mere and availability of resources. Yeah. Another danger for aging societies is that elected governments could decide to mostly represent the interests and fears of their elderly populations, potentially leading to short-term thinking and a preference for people. conserving wealth mm. over innovation. That's not a society that can handle issues like climate change, which need massive investment and fresh ideas, something the world is already having a hard time with. Many people think that having fewer humans on Earth is actually a good thing because our societies are too unsustainable, we're no. using up too many resources, and because of climate change. The problem is, 
that even if you want fewer humans, this process is very likely too slow to have a positive impact on the environment. Your people's just going to make things more expensive, more complicated. You're not going to have as many people to help you do basic things. And that's why, you know, little towns, places get abandoned, like they said. And also doing things like something complicated, like designing a nuclear power plant. There's so many different skill sets. Forget just nuclear engineering. That's just one small aspect of it. I couldn't do basically make a new nuclear power plant all by myself. There's and a lot of it are those jobs with people in their prime like um electricians mechanics construction workers bricklayers um urban planners um financial experts yeah that's there's a whole bunch of specialized jobs before the plant is even operational and you get into things like core design optimization things of that nature the world population is going to grow for at least 60 more years before it may shrink again. By then, we have to solve climate change. Likewise, <laughs> any other upsides a lower population might have will most likely not materialize themselves this century. So just like import people, the easiest import solution people. seems to be immigration. But the fertility of immigrants adjusts to local levels within three generations. So you need a constant a influx solution. of new migrants, which is not sustainable long term like as birth rates are dropping everywhere. Yeah. The only way would be to keep poor countries poor so that the young and motivated migrate wow. to developed countries looking for opportunity and a better life. Kind That's a very messed up future. Like you have this intentional, you have these intentionally poor countries sustained just for the purpose of getting them out and then moving into the rich country. It's very dystopian for the moral thing to wish for by the end of the century africa will have the highest number of young people in the world and so african migrants might become the world's most sought after immigrants with elderly nations fighting hard for every person willing to make the move immigration can also create societal or cultural tensions which is a universal phenomenon in all cultures sure. especially when cultures That's with very different thing. sets of values meet often leading to a backlash that slows immigration down again it's easy to be frustrated at this, but ignoring crises. this will only divide societies, empower demagogues, and increase xenophobia. <laughs> Economically, immigration is largely beneficial for societies, even if this ever. seems counterintuitive to many people. Especially countries like the US, an immigrant nation built on the idea of personal freedom and opportunity through hard work, will benefit the most. Countries like this will have a... That part's true, but the talk about the whole rising healthcare costs, that... Mm. <laughs> Healthcare is extremely expensive here, especially if you don't have insurance. For advantage this century, it's good especially quality, but if it's they can attract expensive. the world's brightest and most ambitious. Conclusion and our opinion. This topic is way too big. Affects societies as diverse yeah, as literally all of humanity. Is... So please take this part with a gigantic grain of salt. Obviously, we're looking at this from our Central European perspective. One way to look at falling birth rates is as a side effect of the world being less bad than it was. Especially women are freer, more educated. And the thing is, it hasn't been around for that long. If you look at as, as long as humanity's existed, it hasn't been around for nearly as long as the rapidly increasing growth rates that have been around since the, uh, the early 1900s and late 1800s. So extrapolating here is is dangerous it's uh just fr just statistically it's it's not gonna make any sense it's like investing in a stock that's going what that's having insane growth in a short period of time and assuming it's gonna do that forever n n no <laughs> wealthier than in the past. But it turns out that if societies are better off, individuals often decide to have fewer kids. Interestingly, there's a gap between how many kids people want and how many they're having. The mean hmm. number of kids women in Europe want is around 2.3, much more than they're actually having. Why? While we gained a lot of freedoms in the last century across continents and economic Drugs. systems, that came at a and cost. IPads. The tight-knit communities and family structures that were part of our nature where kids could be brought up by a village. Today, young parents have to deal with different Bills challenges and societal expectations. Women are kind of ground down between the wish and expectation to have a family and a career, being pressured to do both but not compromise either. 
Uh, yeah, oh, this is getting into some interesting territory here. Yeah, there's a lot, and I will say, like, the, the nuclear industry is no different in terms of certain expectations, like doing a, working a refueling outage, for instance. It's like a 40-day commitment of, like, four-on, one-off, some even more crazy than that. Yeah, try, try taking care of a kid while uh, not having a day off or much of a day off in 40 days, because the one-off isn't really off. It's more, that's when you catch up on your sleep, especially if you're, because especially if you're working nights, you're just, you're going to be at a loss until you get that day, and then you just sleep it. So that sort of high amount of work into cert certain jobs, and nuclear is by no means unique to that. I know a lot of, like, oil and gas do, do things like that as well. Some with like a 14 on 14 off at like a remote location and there's all kinds of crazy demands out there that if if it if it really is an expectation to do both and i know this this affects women more unfairly than than it affects men in terms of raising a and and uh, and having a career just cut back on the number of hours you can do both but that's not gonna add more hours to the day just reduce the just reduce the number of hours or number of days. And a lot of companies are shifting, though, to have more generous um, uh, parental leave, fam uh, family time. I've noticed that within, within a lot of companies within the United States. I don't think this is an unsolvable problem, but we just got to manage our expectations better. <laughs> and are sharing parental duties more equally than... And note that... Yeah, parental leave isn't, but by itself doesn't solve anything. Like this is this is a very complicated topic. But I'm one of those people that says that yeah, this certainly can have a solution, and it's basically just you can have a career, just don't work everyone like crazy. That that really doesn't help anyone. Used to, but are often still expected to be the provider, and it's sadly mm, true yeah. that usually at least one parent's career is held back. In many developed countries, the gender pay gap is chiefly a pay gap between mothers and everyone else. But it's not just outside pressure. Shh. Our culture of individualism probably plays a role too. I know the gender pay gap's a bit more complicated. I don't know specifics that that sounds like an oversimplification saying it is just that it's just affecting mothers or I guess the primary the primary giver and yes, that's it's going to affect women a lot worse just based on just based on those gender roles that are still predominant in society, but it's this is very much in oversimplification. We have only one life to explore, be free, travel, have fun, accomplish something, and try to be happy. So people commit to partners later in life and often decide against big families or any at all. And that's fair. Nobody owes their country babies. So far, no country has successfully managed to increase birth rates significantly, so as of now, we don't really know what works. But here are a few options to at least make the lives of parents much easier. Free and abundant access to childcare, financial benefits for parents, more and cheaper housing. Parenthood has to stop being a career one. obstacle, and our culture needs to become more positive. Yeah, things are significantly more expensive now with uh, how just having a house, having kids in general, again, back to the healthcare costs, especially within the U.S., people just not being able to afford to have kids. What's <clears throat> families? And that's something we can all work on. The next time you sit next to a crying baby, don't be a jerk about it. <laughs> kids are hard. In the end, humanity Babies will cry. not die out because we're having do. fewer babies. <laughs> The age and composition of our societies changes quickly, and we need to deal with that sooner rather than later. But in the end, of all the incredibly hard challenges we've faced before, why would this be the one we can't solve? Yeah, I, like as, as earlier, I don't think this has, this doesn't have a solution. And again, this could just be a correction on a very long-term function of human birth rates, human populations. So. We don't know that this is even going to last. That's everything. I would, I, and I do appreciate Kurtz Gazat acknowledging that to take this with a gigantic grain of salt. So <laughs> it's looking at one statistic by itself has all kinds of problems, um, or it puts you in, in a much riskier situation when it comes to making decisions. So yeah, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't read too much into this if it's all being doom and gloom or, or what have you. There's still plenty of ways for us to solve this problem. But let me know what you think. Maybe I'm missing something here. I don't claim to be an expert on sociology. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.